It's a tale of two titans with Unity and Unreal battling it out versus the brand new contender Godot. Let's take a closer look at those three engines and how they stack up against each other at upcoming indie game Seed of Life. Let's talk about that. So for me, right, whenever I look at all three engines, there's so many differences between all three of them. You've at least looked into all three of these main engines, right? Godot, Unity, Unreal. You've looked into them. You've worked in some capacities with some of them. So as you kind of compare and contrast all three of these, kind of give me the positives and the negatives of these engines. For Seed of Life, I'm using Unity, and I think its biggest advantage is that it has a hyperactive community and a ton of community-made content and asset store. There has never really been a problem Problem that I wasn't able to look up on a forum and uh, there hasn't been uh, an asset that I weren't able to look up on the asset store so it's so big that you basically have anything you need. Mm-hmm. I would say that it also has very solid Android development which I think is, is its main source of success and uh, well it used to be the number one choice for virtual reality and augmented reality. Not really the case anymore but for the longest time it used to be that. The main problems with Unity come from its crappy management. Uh, Ever since it went public, it started to sort of rush features into production before they were completely ready. There are tons of examples, but the two that come in mind right now are the uh, universal render pipeline and the high definition render pipeline. Those are basically the two features that are responsible for rendering things in Unity, and they both have very different ways of working, but they're all lacking lots of features in my opinion, and they're really, really pushing those down our throats. So I think this is one of the uh, uh, one of the byproducts of Unity's management right now. You don't really have this problem with Unreal Engine because Unreal Engine has been the, the lead in terms of graphical improvements and uh, graphics types for a really good while now. And I'd say it's way easier to get AAA grade graphics when you're making a game with Unreal. The biggest advantage of Unreal is that it packs up lots and lots of features. You definitely don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm-hmm. Almost all the basic features that you need to make a game, the, the basic building blocks that you need to make the games are already implemented into the engine so it's really just a matter of adapting them to your needs and just assembling the game and besides the engine is really tailored for large teams one of the um, uh, most important points of unreal engine as well is uh, blueprint which is its visual programming tool which can either be a blessing or your worst nightmare depending on uh, who you ask but uh, having a visual programming tool which is that much embedded into the engine can be really useful for pro typing and for all the indie developers out there who have trouble with programming or writing code. You can of course write code in C++ but uh, everything you can do with C++ you can also do with Blueprint so that's also a nice thing to have. The problems I had with Unreal Engine is that uh, everything you want to do you have to do it the engine way. If you want to do things slightly differently you have to work against the engine and if you have a game that requires a lot of customization for the rendering or for the gameplay or if you want to do things a little differently, like, uh, you're gonna have to work for them. But like Godot, right? I don't think anybody really, really even paid attention to Godot until late 2023, and then all of a sudden it was very much like put into the limelight, and everybody was researching it and looking into it and trying to figure out what it was and how they could use it and if it was a viable option. And it really, I mean, outside of like maybe like CryEngine and a couple other ones out there that nobody really has used in years, it really is the only other third option available to developers. So talk Talk to me about that one for a second, because I know very little about Godot. Yeah, well, um, it's true that for the longest time, God, I never know if I should pronounce it Godot or Godot, but... Uh, I don't know which one is right, so to be <laughs> honest, yeah, we, yeah, we uh, can do I've it I've always said Godot. Yeah, yeah I've always said Godot, so I'm, I'm not going to change it. Do it. Uh, for, the, for the longest time, it's always has kind of been there, mm-hmm. you know, we, we knew it existed, yeah. but it's true. Like you said, we, we never really looked into it, and I think uh, only the hardcore fans, I'd say, with mm-hmm. big quotation marks, uh, were really that invested into that engine. Mm. But it's true that after the Unity fiasco, it actually was extremely well-timed for Gather because they were just about to release their uh, 4.1 version, mm. so the timing couldn't have been better for them. They kind of 
have indirectly used that whole unity thing to attract all the all the devs and invite them to to try the engine. And I should, some of them started to do some pretty amazing stuff with it as well. Mm. Like many others, I also started to look into it. I have downloaded it. I played around with it. Yeah. And well, the fact that it's completely free and completely open source means that anything you make with it is yours. And coming from Unity, I'd say I had a much easier time learning Gala than Unreal, actually, <laughs> uh, because there are some similarities between the two. Overall, I'd say it's much similar. It's much more similar to Unity than it is to Unreal. Yeah. So I had a much easier time learning that. The problem I had with Gala is that even though it's really easy to start prototyping and you know just get going with your project, mm. it seems to still be young and therefore very limited in what it's capable to do. Yeah. Out of the box, I mean, uh, it's kind of the opposite of Unreal in that in that regard. It's that Unreal packs everything that you can dream of into into the engine. That's why the engine's so big. Yeah. And with Gala, there's very very little, so you have to work for all of those features. Mm. So of course it's highly customizable because you can write all of those yourself. But uh, if you're trying to make a very large 3D resource heavy game, you're gonna have to work for it. I'm always interested to see what the trends are like going into the end of the year. I always think it's really cool to see like what people are predicting and what people are excited about and what they think is gonna be the next big thing in the industry. What I think is that uh, for esports to be a thing, you know, to exist, you need the game to be popular enough. I think if a developer someday decides I'm gonna make the, the new esports game, the new esports trend is gonna be huge. Uh, well, it's, it's extremely difficult to compete with the uh, the already well established huge ones, and I don't think that the huge ones aren't gonna go away anytime soon. So I think esports is just going to continue its you know its way towards 2024. But I don't think we're gonna see that much new material. Yeah, with VR, right? What's your opinion on that one? I, I think VR just needs to wake up. Mm. Really, uh, I do think that it has an that potential. Yeah. But in my opinion, it suffers two major problems. Mm. The first one is that the gear is extremely expensive, and not a lot of people have you know headset style required to play VR games. Yeah. Uh, even though, like you said, some companies like Meta and uh, Sony are trying to make it more available mm. to the general audience, it's still very expensive and it's still difficult to get your hands on it. Yeah. And the second problem is that video games are having a really hard time innovating these days. I've seen that a lot of games are trying to just slump VR on top of an existing game mm. just as a marketing stunt. Yeah. And I think what, that when VR becomes great it's when the game has been developed with VR in mind. You, you can't just type an action-adventure game and put VR on it and call it a die. That doesn't bring anything to the game that's just, like I said, that's just a stunt. You know, yeah. that, uh, so yes, you can look around in the world but you could do that before. So yeah, I think that for VR to actually work, yeah, we need studios to stop making game for VR. The one thing that I forgot is gaming on demand, right? Which is just another name in 2024 for cloud gaming. I mean, that's really all it is, right? I love the concept. I, I love it. I think it's amazing. Cloud game, you can play, you know, AAA games wherever. It's awesome. But again, it's only as good as the technology, right? It's interesting when Google and NVIDIA try to do something and they can't do it. And I think that's a, a major, major sign that the technology is not there yet. Because if those two can't make it work, then who else is going to make it work? But now Netflix is trying it, so who knows? Like, But they're doing yeah. it on a much lower scale, right? They're doing it with mobile games, I guess, with like high-end mobile games. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Like, do you think that it's closer? Well, I think it really depends on finding the the right method of implementing it. Like you said, Google have tried, uh, Netflix is trying right now, and all of those companies that are trying their end that making uh, gaming on demand are all trying to attack it from different angles. They're all trying slightly different things. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why it uh, doesn't always work is that it doesn't really know what the audience is for gaming on demand. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the gamers that are interested in the most uh, resource-heavy games mm -hmm. already have gear, so they're not really interested in that. They That's can true. just use their gear that they built or mm -hmm. bought themselves. Yeah. And the other more casual players are not necessarily interested uh, into the game that uh, mm. are offered by Gaming Continent. So for that reason, I don't think that it's going to be the next big thing in the year or maybe two because they're still trying to find the right angle of attack, mm. so to speak. You're an indie developer. You're a one-person team right now. You've been working on Seed of Life for a while at this point. What are some of the most difficult aspects of development? The biggest struggle mm. uh, that I continuously face is finding the energy to keep on moving, really. When I started, I had this problem. Mm. At first, it was exhilarating.
generating. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to make this game. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to uh, make things that way. I'm going to implement things that way. Mm -hmm. So at first, it's fun because you're just imagining things, yeah. and prototyping, and then you have to actually implement those things. And this is where uh, things become grinding, like you said. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not as exhilarating anymore. And having to balance a full time job next to that, it's just turned this whole thing into this this uh, foggy mass. You don't know uh, if or when you're going to come out of it. Yeah. You just continuously work on the game. Uh, like you said, I'm a one-man team and I actually have a full-time job on the side as well. So I have, first of all, I have to find balance between these two activities. Yeah. In order to avoid this problem, uh, I'm actually using project management apps uh, even though I'm working solo, yeah, uh, like Trello most of the time, and that's to clearly define the scope of the game. So uh, I've decided to like, I'm going to do this fixed set of things mm -hmm. or seed of life, and I'm not going to go beyond that. So that way I'm trying to avoid future creep. Yeah. Then when I know exactly what I'm going to do, it's easier to break it into chunks. Mm -hmm. And I'm basically forcing myself uh, as much as I can to just respect the scope and go one chunk at the time. For example, I might uh, just isolate a specific feature yeah. of the game and just work on that for like uh, for like a week or something. And when it's done, I celebrate it and I just count this as a as a little victory. Yeah. And that's I mean that sounds a little bit silly, but that's how no. that's what allows me to just you know move on and, uh, and go on to the next thing and the next thing and eventually I'll probably reach the end uh, yeah. after all those uh, smaller parts from my perspective the whole like putting it on Trello having milestones you hit the small successes thing makes complete sense to me because a lot of the times I hear from developers they say I've been working on the game for two years right and the end isn't anywhere in sight and I feel like I'm drowning and I feel like there's no you know you don't have a sense of accomplishment because you're just grinding through this game and you're trying to push something out and like you're not going anywhere and that really kind of wears you down so having that sense of like just clicking that button and seeing that you're done and then on to the next thing and on to the next thing it kind of gives you more i would imagine it gives you more willpower to just keep rolling and, and gives you that sense of affirmation as you keep going as well yeah well ever since i started to shank it down into smaller pieces mm -hmm. uh it became a lot easier like yeah. really a lot easier to to work on it and also it's uh, it uh, allows me to actually not feel guilty when I'm taking breaks as well. What about the gameplay, though? Talk to me about the gameplay, talk to me about the story, talk to me about the mechanics. What makes this game special? What makes it stick out? Give me the elevator pitch for Sea of Life and what people should expect with this. Sea of Life is an old-school, story-driven action-adventure game mm -hmm. where you play as a young wolf spirit named Hope on a quest to restore natural order. Mm -hmm. In your journey, you're accompanied by a little bird named Letty, and the main, the, the gameplay core is is about switching between those two characters, between the wolf and the bird, mm -hmm. and use their distinct abilities to make progress. We'll be traveling between various different areas and ancient temples filled with traps and puzzles. Mm -hmm. You'll be fighting formidable enemies, sometimes 10 times your size, and you'll unlock new abilities that will allow you to discover new locations as you make progress. I'd say Seed of Life is, is a perfect blend between action adventure and metroidvania, mm -hmm. with the twist that you're controlling uh, two very different characters at the same time, controlling the wolf and the bird. Yeah. Uh, ironically, I think that what sets it apart is that I'm trying to recreate some old design philosophies from the GameCube era yeah. uh, that were kind of lost in time. I'm trying to combine it with the quality of life that we have with games today, yeah. and the standards uh, that we are more used nowadays. So yeah, the I think the, the defining feature is ironically that I'm doing things old ways, <laughs> uh, the old way. I'm not hiding that my main and inspiration for this game is Legend of Zelda and I've often said that Seed of Life is a Zelda-like and even an Ocarina of Time-like. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that can kind of revive that uh, philosophy with Seed of Life and if it works well maybe I'll make even more games uh, in that in that particular uh, using that particular formula. I like that. I like that. You know I think it's a good point. A random thought that comes to mind for me and I don't even know if you can do it is can you port a game to GameCube anymore or is that not even possible? <laughs> well, you can't really like create a physical 
Like, could you do that? I don't know. Would that be copyrighted? Uh, well, uh, oh, it's, it's actually an interesting question, and I actually did look into it as oh, okay. well at some point. Yeah. First of all, you can't port an existing game to GameCube. That's just not possible. Yeah. Uh, we, have, we have to understand that the GameCube is a very old machine mm -hmm. with very very limited capabilities and yeah. it's kind of like old computers you have to do things one way and if you don't do it that way it won't work or well, the gamecube is kind of like that yeah, yeah and that being said it is in theory possible to make a game for the gamecube yeah but first of all you have to use some custom dev kits because you can't just acquire the dev kits from nintendo they i mean they, they just won't support the gamecube anymore so yeah, right. that's not possible you need to use a custom dev kit mm -hmm. which is possible if you look on Line, you can find uh, something like that yeah. uh, and then you have to actually write an engine from scratch uh, in order to support the game on the GameCube I got you. which is difficult even more so than with PC because like I said the GameCube is a very old machine yeah, yeah. so probably so it's not. possible in th it's possible in theory but uh, don't hold your breath <laughs> Fair enough. But I do hope that if you like the GameCube and if uh, the people watching this yeah. do like GameCube games and love those games from this particular period of time, I do think that you will like Seal of Life. Mm. Awesome. Awesome.